Bueno, bienvenidas a todas. Welcome, everyone, to this new meeting, to this new, uh, to the to the cross that readings. Today, in Blue Red, we're a lot, we have an alliance with the Canadian Embassy to talk about how the poetry uh, is a reflection of a cosmogony of a territory and a history. We will, this period, we will be talking with our Canadian poet, Natasha Kennebe from the new community and the Colombian poet, Hugo Hamion from the, from the Kamisak community. Natasha Kennebe was born in, in Besame, Quebec, in Canada. She, uh, as, uh, as she indicated, she's uh, from, uh, as I mentioned, she's a poet, poet, performer, visual artist, actress, and she's an activist uh, for the indigenous and environmental rights. Uh, and that uh, she fights against discrimination, colonialism, and which is something that she has suffered herself with her book, Do Not Go, uh, No Interesa Mi Alma Con Tu Zapatos. Uh, she, wore, she won an award, uh, another pop book. It's a, a manifesto. Uh, mi amigo and Nani Miswat, the, the island of the thunder, Natasha. Welcome to this space. Thank you so much for joining us. También está Hugo Hamioy. Nos we also have Hugo Hamioy. He was born uh, in the Valle de Sinulo in Putumayo, Colombia. He's one of the most important oh, literary eh, figures literario, eh, del país. in the country. He's a poet, investigator of Rodley and indigenous thinking in Colombia with the tradition of the Kamensat people whose activities are focused on agriculture, medicine, and um, carving. And Hugo Hamoy has uh, engaged the, the power of word of speech to talk about the yes. fundamental rights of indigenous communities. Among his books, uh, we have Ma, Mi Fuego, Mi Uno, Mi Tierra, Mi Sol, No Somos Siente, and Tanzante del Viento. Hugo, welcome, and thank you for, for allowing us this uh, space. Thank you for the invitation. I am very pleased uh, to be able to share with you, with Natasha, and to establish this dialogue so that we can create at this time this exchange of, uh, of, um, of the two uh, communities. This and I'm very pleased uh, to share the to share these words. Hi, I'm part of the Kancha indigenous community located in the Valle Similo in, in the department of Potomayo, which is the northern part of the Colombian Amazons area. And due to due to the the reasons that I have to that I, that we had to move, I live in the in the north of Colombia in the Araco community, where. I have been adopted as uh, one of their their sons. Uh, this this is uh, this is an extremely spiritual um, community. Thank you, Natasha. Welcome to share. Bueno, pues yo quiero arrancar. I want to start. Uh, Natasha's poems uh, and Hugo Hamio's uh, poems are are a reflection of their cosmogony, their, their history and their territories. They both write in their uh, native tongues. And at the same time, they, in the case of Natasha, French, and in the case of Hugo Hamio, Spanish. The first question that I would like to ask you both is what are the language challenges that uh, you face when the poem is not no longer in your autochthonous or your native tongue? Who would like to begin? Natasha, would, uh, would you like to start? Uh, I just want to be sure to have understood uh, the direction of the question. Yes. Yeah, sure. So, what, oh. what, yeah, yeah, yeah. What did you mean by... Um, yeah, can you repeat it in English? <laughs> yeah. When when you write a poem in your language, in the Inu language, what do you think is the um, the um, what what do you think it's 
the principal problem or, or uh. when, when you start to translate that poem in, in French or in English? Yeah, okay, thank you. I was, I just, I, I understood, but I was, I just wanted to be sure. Um, so for me, it's like, um, I don't write a lot in, in Inu because uh, it's, uh, although it's my first language, I lost it when I was a, a child, like almost like a teenager. And then I was able to work uh, to be able to speak it again uh, in the 10 past years. Yeah, and then after, since. Really? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm just going to interrupt you just a, a, a second, because I'm not pretty sure if Hugo is right now, if he has the interpretation. Ah, the translation, yeah. Okay, yeah, so let me just ask him. Um, Hugo, sí. en la plataforma, en la parte inferior. Hugo, uh, I'm... on the bottom part, Natasha, can you hear me? Can you hear the interpretation? Tú puedes hacer clic. Natasha, can you confirm if you're hearing the interpretation? Para que se vaya haciendo la traducción simultánea de lo que está diciendo Natasha en, en inglés. Natasha, Perfect. can you hear the interpretation into English? Eh, uh, sí. Listo. Entonces, Natasha, can you start again please i'm sorry <laughs> yeah it's okay uh so i was saying do you hear me hugo now in, sí. in spanish sí, estoy escuchando. <laughs> <laughs> Perfecto. <laughs> okay so yeah i was saying um uh for me in my situation what happened is uh i was speaking first in Eamon when i was a child and then i lost it uh when i grew up because i was uh growing up in, in town, so not in my village. And I, I started speaking French. And then I just got French for years and years. And with the time, I just uh, ended up losing my language, you know. And so for the 10 past years, I was working to be able to re-speak it because uh, I was still understanding it. Uh, then in the past years, the recent the recent years, I, I started uh, trying to write more in Inu. You know, so in, in the new collection of poems I'm working on right now, I, I have been working, uh, writing more in Inuimun. So what I will say is uh, the main problems that can I can meet uh, meanwhile is um, the, the, the structures of the languages are very, very different because uh, uh, French and English are very close already. So they are from the same roots, linguistic roots. But Inu is very, from a very different structure and mentality and, and a way of uh, constructing the sentences. So it's like also for the verbs, it's separated in, in different uh, ways of, uh, I don't know how to say that, according, according to verbs, I don't know how to say that. It, it's separated in two different uh, ways of saying the verbs. We, we have more verbs of action as well, action verbs, and we have animate and inanimate. So we are separating things like that with the living and the non-living. And all the verbs are different we, if we are speaking about animals or rocks and, you know, things that. Uh, so I would say that we have to, it's not actually an, a translation between Inu and uh, I would say colonial languages, but it's mainly a kind of adaptation of what we want to translate or to transmit, uh, I, I should say, uh, from the Inu to the, to the, uh, French or English so it's like the images also are very like they are very clear in Inu and sometimes they can become uh, I don't I don't want to mean something else by saying it but I would say there is some kind of abstraction coming out in French because like the French can't understand what the Inu words actually means because they are you say one Inu words, uh, Inu word, and it's speaking about not only about the situation or the action, but also about what's happening around 
the situation. So it's like a very 3D or even 6D <laughs> perception of, of, of the reality. And when you speak in French or English, it's like only the surface of things. And mean, meanwhile, in Inu, it's like when you speak, you speak about everything that is related to you or the action uh, happening in the moment. I would say that's that are the, the main problem. Claro. Me imagino. La, la complejidad. I imagine the complexity of the terms uh, which are impossible to translate into these languages, as you call them, uh, colonials. What do, you, what do you think about this, Hugo? I find a difference. There's a difference between Spanish and Kamcha, which is my mother tongue. And I think that this is, this is something that I would like to uh, this is something that I would like to begin Digo with uh, in this conversation. There is a profound difference. There is a profound distance because uh, the Kamsha language is a maternal language. I mean, this is extremely, and I think that the I think that the indigenous um, the languages globally they're based on that principle. They're, they're pretty maternal. And uh, in the particular case of Spanish, uh, we, uh, we, there's a, this implies a more masculine voice. And I actually find a strong, a profound difference. And it is not that this involves a difficulty, but, but there, we need to do a lot of efforts when we try to to make sure that pues, uh, and, uh, yourself, in my case, in, in Spanish, you know, to have this dual effort in order to make sure that the uh, people uh, that you're uh, speaking mm. to can receive the message that uh, which is easier for us when we when we speak in our mother tongue and and if the interlocutor or the speaker is somebody in our community so this is where we can we can go to, into a universe when you talk in your mother tongue then you activate all these these different uh, energies of a particular universe and only those of us who speak the, the language will feel it and one that's one of the major differences in other words our grandmothers they insist they they say that that, that we are we are those who know we're the owners of knowledge in order for you to understand that our knowledge the only gateway to what we have is your language if you want to understand what we want to convey or what we want to say you need to speak the language so that's where there is a limiting uh, factor when you receive a message from your grandmother or your grandfather and when you try to make uh, to to convey this is uh, to a person who does not speak this language so this uh, will lose all the spiritual strength that you use to transmit this but there's but that's where you can find your skill or your, your ability to be able to transmit and to make sure that this uh, spiritual strength that grandmothers and grandparents uh, have used to convey the message uh, can help the other person who's not speaking our language can receive that spiritual content that they use to go that which is conveyed by our parents so that's uh, where i find a huge difference uh, the first one is that that the maternal sense uh, used to convey the messages leads to a different dimension and why am i saying maternal because we learn we learn our tongue on the first uh, uh, seven to eight years we, from from the moment where um, we are were cuddled by our mother uh, by our mothers during their their pregnancy and they convey that which is uh, spoken verbally and this is something that is heard as a sound but 
uh, all but all the feelings of our mothers uh whatever she's feeling their their mindsets their mood and this uh, builds a way of uh, of how for us those words sonidos or pues those sounds not only are they sounds to to convey the description of an object or a moment but they go beyond they go beyond the physical part in other words our our tongue goes beyond uh, seeing this as a simple as a simple sound to communicate simply uh, instead for example when we say let's uh, let's use a uh, when I say hinge, for example, when somebody in my community, in my indigenous uh, a grandparent, a grandfather or grandmother, when they say trinje, then we activate some energies that will connect us with time or with the creating be with creator being uh, with the light and with that line that divides clarity and uh, day and night or dark darkness and it connects to to that masculine being which he, which uh, has the sea when we say shinka we're referring to the sun but the sun is not just the, uh, a ball of fire that we see on top of us but it represents this whole thing it represents time it represents a giver uh it represents uh the better of the seed and and the time the that we see the sun from the light it bears the seed and it is a masculine being it is it is creating on that uh, and that feminine and it refers to to the earth so just one word Look at the at the energy that it implies and the content it's ha it has. So it is activated. But instead, if I if I say hey Jane and if and if I start explaining what this means, it it activates like a single code, which is the sun. And then there will be the question to you when when I say something about uh, something about the sun, what do you feel? In our case, we activate this whole uh, different elements. So every word has these uh, lines uh, that uh, arise spiritually. But this is something that we can experience because our, our mother woman have the capacity to convey all the different lines of, of uh, spiritual feeling or sentiment. Who better than our mothers uh, who can be responsible for, who are responsible for our education until six or seven years of age when we when we when we start uh, uh, when we as men we start uh, going but these first years of life these are essential in order to know what's the dimension of our of our language so that's where i find one of the first differences i don't mean to say that this is a difficulty but a challenge instead if i talk we are going to establish the dimension of uh, the words. But if I convey this for the Spanish speakers, that's going to be my challenge in order to, to take these words, to organize them in such a way that that force, that strength that is trans conveyed in my tongue can be shared with you, the Spanish speakers. Well, at the end of the day, this is the same challenge. Uh, I, and I have the question at this time, if, if uh, in reality, I wonder uh, about this uh, challenge in translation, for example, when we have a book, in the case of uh, Hugo Hamioy, which is one that I have in my hand, which is Danzante, del Viento in both uh, languages, I wonder if I am achieving or if I'm getting to read and receive uh, like uh, the intention that is being provided uh, or given to the poems. 
hasta qué punto en estos So I wonder up to what point in, in this uh, translation it is possible to convey whatever you want to convey. In the case of uh, Natasha, you were talking about a, a rewriting. Sí, uh, sí, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm not enough good in Spanish to be able, but soon, soon enough, I think I will be able to speak Spanish. <laughs> but um, yeah, about the example, the intention, like I, I, it, in the past years here here in Quebec and Canada, it, it, it seems that it has been like, a, well, I'm gonna start with that first. I, I have been, I has, uh, yeah, I have been uh, translating books from indigenous authors uh, from English to French. So I have been working on a few books like that, and I'm working actually on a translation of a poet. But before that, it was mostly uh, someone writing in poet, poem, poems and prose in the same time. Uh, and translating a whole collection of poems is very different. And because for for a long time, I have been um, noticing that sometimes, you know, like indigenous cultures, they are very, very, uh, I said that already, like they're very different, but they have like such details that are not actually accessible to the, I would say to the dominant society and to everyone in, in the country. And also, like sometimes here we have many, many nations, different peoples, indigenous people. So it's hard also to have access to all the informations, uh, cultures, uh, historical notices also, also. So it's like it's very hard, I think, for anyone that, who is not indigenous to actually, I think, understand deeply poems mostly poetry but also like uh, novels or short novels uh, different stories uh and to be able to translate it uh, in a language you know it, translation is is there to be to make a text or a book accessible to the mo to the most people uh, possible it's not, maybe my my sentence is very mixed up but and uh but in the same time sometimes i was wondering what's the point at the end if we translate the text but we don't actually we are not able to transmit the real intention of the person it would just become the barriers that are not making the, this intention or intentions or main purpose of the poems or, or the text the writing of the the, the author uh, actually accessible and well you know from a language to another and sometimes i find it more difficult for for indigenous authors if they are not writing in french or english already like very easily or if they have been already writing directly in french or english if they have been like mostly writing in, in an indigenous language i find it very hard uh, or risky, you know, to translate them because I think then we need a kind of indigenous translator or someone knowing very deeply the, the nation or the mentality of the people to be able to translate the poems or the text because I think without that we are going to miss out a lot of things of what the writer wanted to, to transmit and I think that also the text exists because the writer wanted to transmit something very important about a feeling, an experience, and, and about maybe even the philosophy or the mentality of their people. So sometimes I, I think these things are very, uh, they, they, they are complicated, but if we are enough sensitive about it, we're gonna find out, you know, how to, to make our way through and be able to, to, to to, to translate very well the, 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 I would say the word or the words of, of indigenous uh, writers. Uh, but I would say that in my case, uh, as uh, I have been translating already some books, I know how a translator works. And sometimes when I have the chance, I work very closely with the translator. And 
like now in the past years I have I have been uh, studying Spanish. So then the day someone will wake uh, to translate my poems to Spanish, I really want to be close and to be able to say, this is from the Inu culture, this is from the Quebecois culture. Um, I use some elements of the Quebecois culture to speak about my culture and to make the people feel an experience of being indigenous in Quebec, you know, so it's like, and also to feel sometimes the colonialism, the oppression we can have, uh, you know, so there the, the are a few things that I have been thinking a lot this past year is about translation. So I will, I will pass the, 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 how's that, the word to Hugo so he can go on, but that's what I have been um, experiencing this past year. Hugo, ¿tú quieres agregar algo? Hugo, would you like to add anything else? Hola. Que me, me quedo pensando, sí, en, en esa complejidad que igual está... I'm thinking about the complexity that, that Natasha is expressing at the end of the day when doing the translation. Uh, it what... is, uh, uh, then uh, she, uh, you're adopting a, a colonizing language. So there are many contradictions uh, that may take place. I don't know what what uh, would you wanted to add Hugo, in terms of what Natasha is sharing. Well, I think that we do agree that I want to reinforce what Natasha was mentioning. I mean, there's a dual uh, writing exercise. So from there, we will be based on the fact that I would, uh, there's like a double effort of uh, inspiration or creation. Because one thing is to to write in our mother tongue, which is what makes it easier. But taking this uh, to Spanish uh, in a language, there is you need to do this effort for a new creative process. So in other words, so we will be uh, conveying the same message in two different tongues. And therefore, I'm, I'm based on something really valuable but, but in the Kamacha uh, ma uh, language, no, I would say that the, the global uh, indigenous languages have a very particular characteristic and it's that they are really a cult. I mean, they have uh, created extremely polite languages or from a dimension uh, that is human so profound that a single word will 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 connect you that will connect you to that uh, to that process but there's a, a sort of a construction that is such that i don't know if it, it could involve a, a poetry so beginning by the fact that we're talking about an external characterization and it will be worth asking yourself if, if in my tongue there is uh, the word poem and poetry, this is not, uh, I don't know if in, in your language in Inu, if it is there, but there are equivalences Poetry is not uh, is not uh, something that exists. And uh, based on this, uh, we can adopt uh, an external identity. So um, we normally try to to frame whatever we do. So if we talk about an equivalence in our in our case. Uh, I would say Botaman Villan, and and uh, and what others would say that is a, a poet. Uh, that will be my equivalent. 
uh, I don't know if I'm going if I'm going to be punished for daring to say this, but just to understand this illustration. And I would say that a botamandilla, which means the man or the woman. Uh, and that case, that's what we need to refer when we say botamandilla. We're talking about uh, a woman or a man who are preserving the word pomita. So, and they become people who are invited within our ceremonies just to share that nice word, depending on the context. If if, uh, if there are men and women who are specialized in that welcoming la uh, language for the newborn, if it, if it is a baptism, there are others that uh, specialize with their nice words for that moment, uh, for the development when when a girl gets her menstruation, when when and when a male gets uh, develops there are there are women and men who who have those nice words to make the person understand well when the girl gets her first menstruation and and she's explained why is she going through that change so there's somebody who specializes in that area when they when there's we have the the ceremony of wedding There are other persons who who convey the dimension of of uh, that person as a man, and the dimension of whoever is going to join him as a woman. That same uh, happens with women. They explain the condition, what's their greatness as a woman, but also the greatness of whoever is going to join him or her, who, a man. And then finally, when when death. Uh, which is the last uh, uh, vital uh, moment. These are there, these are men or women having this beautiful word for this uh, last uh, moment to say goodbye. So in this case, I don't know if if I have to reduce this to what what poetry or uh, means, but there are. A very very particular moments that are part of our identity, where you where you set where we understand and, and the dimension of this, uh, and at times I de, I dare to say well that this uh, with this external situation there are phrases that involve a poetry or or there are words just a single word uh, cannot become a a verse or, or a poem as such. So this action that I'm describing at this time of these uh, specialists at this time, for example, they can create, a, which which in our words is called Hawa Yanan. And Hawa Yanan is the action of guiding, of uh, advising. And there are many translations. And of those translations, one that I like the most is one of the has been collectively created by our community where we identify when they say how when is when we're uh, planting the word in your heart how can i how can i modify i mean this is something that has been done what else can i add or, or what can i take uh, away from one has been said and there are other interpretations. So if this is a compound word and if we break it down, you we will see that, the, that we will understand the whole universe. So by just just by saying the Hawaiian means planting the word in your heart, I think that this will be extremely appealing at this will have such a strength that uh, from Spanish, uh, you can actually uh, establish the dimension of it. You can see how this constructive translation or being able to share this message in a different tongue, in my case, into Spanish, it requires 
this context, uh, particularly when I do the translation, uh, the first, uh, my my dad passed away three years ago, uh, and he he normally said he he uh, helped me in my in my work. And uh, my brother, he's a great uh, translator. Yes, yes. We have different members of the community and people can say, well, this is something that you understand. So this is a very nice exercise in order to feel at ease that whatever we're doing uh, corresponds to what you feel within the community. So there, in this regard, that there we can develop a huge, huge uh, chair. But I think that I want to illustrate this a little bit more have a little bit more to give you an idea or to have a better approach, which is a whole universe. Muchas gracias, Hugo. Natasha, ¿quieres responder algo al respecto? Me quedo pensando. Me, me da curiosidad también. Natasha, saber. I'm curious. I don't know if in, in, in your palabra. case, and you know, there is, a, there is a one word for oh, poet si or for a poem, or, or if you have any a different type of construction in this, in this, uh, in this uh, collection of words. To read some, some, some poems right now? Sure, yeah, sure. Okay, sorry, because I was uh, disactivating the, how said that? Uh, <laughs> interpretation in the meantime, so I lost a bit of what you say. <laughs> oh, okay. No, I, I was just asking right now, do you have the interpretation button or should I should I uh, speak no, no, or in Spanish? What do you want? English. English, <laughs> just to be sure. <laughs> no, just that Hugo who was saying that um in his language he doesn't have actually the poet term or poem. So I was wondering if you actually in Inu, um, do you have the poet or poem term or? Translation from Inu to English or French that it, it doesn't even exist. Uh, it, it didn't exist for us either. Uh, actually, um, in the past years, uh, we created the word uh, Hanon Eimon for poetry, which means uh, words of pride. Like, it sounds like our, our way of seeing poetry and what is poetry and also because we have seen a lot of indigenous poets like always speaking about pride and being proud of you know reading sharing their culture they're they're also like claiming identity territories and all i think that's why we seen poetry as words of pride and so in in uh, the word unknown Eamon appeared in the past years to speak about it and i find it very uh, poetic as well <laughs> And the thing is, yeah, poetry and the words poetry and poets, they didn't exist for a long time. Uh, and now when I'm giving like workshops of poetry, uh, of writing uh, to uh, young, young students, uh, mostly young indigenous students, uh, I really want to tell them like, because uh, when I was uh, uh, very young, when I grew up, I was seeing, I was hearing like books, literature, poetry, you know, think these things, they were from the white people, you know, they were not ours and we, we shouldn't use them or we, we shouldn't learn to use them, you know, that's, that, that are things I used to hear like long time ago. And of course today it's very different. But also because now here, mostly in indigenous literature, we are speaking always about the fact that writing, of course, didn't exist for us. Actually, like the writing and writing words and uh, as we know it now from the, the dominant societies, but in uh, 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 Western societies, but what we say and what we claim now is the fact that literature, indigenous literature, already existed in the only in orality before in an uh, on oral form i would say and we say now that 
poetry, a poetry literature, it's mostly a kind of vehicle, uh, literature, right, written literature is a vehicle for orality and oral tradition of indigenous cultures. So we are using books as supports and, and main, now radio, TV, all these things that, that were also, that are things where uh, or places where we would not be, we would not seen, and we would not like actually heard, and we are using these places as as vehicle, only to be able to to raise again our reality and to speak again about our own cultures by ourselves, which is very important, I think, because before, people mostly in Canada, I, I, I'm not sure in in the south, but uh in canada and of course europe and north america uh there there were always people speaking about our cultures without us making things about our cultures without us and what we want to do now with literature and cinema and other things other forms of art we want to claim again these territories as ours and how they used to be for us also in other forms because, uh, by example, we had debate about what is indigenous theater. People say in Europe, uh, here, like indigenous theater didn't exist because it didn't exist through their own lens. But for us, it existed in many kinds of 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 of, of shapes and forms, and of course, ceremonies. They were for us the first places where the sacred theater uh, ha has been. And also, like the sacred poetry has been as well, like very living and very like uh, going through all aspects of our life. And that's why I say like people here they say, uh, indigenous artists they are most of the time very interdisciplinary. Like they are they are able to make many kinds of things in the same time. You know, they are able to express in many ways. And I always say like. But we used to be these people, like we were without the definition of being artists of poets, we were already these things, you know, this, 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 we, we had already this identity and entities, but the only difference where they were just already so, so much part of our lives already. Because when I say to the students, poetry is ours, actually, it's because it, it used to be our only vision of being in the world of being in into the environment into the nature and why we were nomadic is because i'm sure of it it's because it's part of it's because party <laughs> of our way of seeing things and being in a poetic way into the land because we we remember that poetry is the definition of poetry is mostly relating things and, and how we are relating to things exterior of us, inside of us, and how we are making these things or seeing these things being related or interrelated. So we were actually poets just being on the land and just being connected to the land. So I think that now poets and mostly, of course, indigenous poets, they are able to rise again this, 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 this perception or uh, uh, we, con the, the, these ways of conceiving human relationship with nature. And I think through poetry, we are able also to make humans, human beings, to go back to this kind of relationship with not only the nature, but everything around us. And mostly, of course, ours, our own people, indigenous peoples between them, and also, of course, us with the, with, uh, with the, the main societies. And just to try to finish, I try to remember what the other thing I wanted to say is like, uh, yeah, we were artists and I want to know why I see we are interdisciplinary now. It's just cause we were nomadic and surviving in, onto the land, into the land we needed to be able to master so many things at the same time, you know, and mastering and being able to use tools make the tools make the you know the clothing and houses you know everything we learned it for millennia and it, it it has been like techniques that has been like very how I say that perfectionated perfectionated for millennia as well so 
I believe at some point what we were able to make before colonization with our own hands and what we were able to think about with our own mind is like it's philosophy, true philosophy and true art uh, and a very like high level developed um, yeah, uh, developed form of these things. And that's why I, I think all our past as nomadic nomadics and, and um, very strong people, artists are and poets are the main witnesses of what how we used to be and how we are able to to erase again our true identity as artists and poets and philosophers. Obviously. <laughs> Thank you, Natasha. Hugo, no sé si quieras como responder o agregar algo. Hugo, I don't know if there's anything you would like to add on your style. You're muted. We can't hear you. I'm sorry, my apologies. Apologies. I it is so important uh, to have this uh, space so that we can talk about this topic because I uh, because this is something that we hardly deal with and and perhaps knowing the the specificities of it of every body. What uh, Natasha has indicated is really important. I mean that the, we should not detach from from those traditions and practices, traditional practices which are part of our life. I think that. That's where a good part or or part of the secret uh, is there, especially around trying to understand our world, the, what the world means to us. Because apart, in addition to this effort uh, to to uh, uh, be willing to do a translation of our and to convey the essence of our, our word. There's another issue, and it's the fact that we are we're, we're, we're modern indigenous, and that modernity is uh, giving us a different perspective, that uh, ancient uh, word. So this is where we are, is, we are delving into something that is uh, very young in terms of uh, a proposal that we've been working with some of the uh, writers in indigenous languages and which is which has to do with the with the organization as a proposal uh, where a proposal where we're trying to identify ourselves and which will allow us to propose from uh, within our perspectives what we thing that in what in our opinion should call the attention to the non-speakers, not only to listen, but for those who have an interest in studying our craft. Uh, somebody may want to see us as, a, as poets, indigenous poets, and that's a one way uh, we can call ourselves indigenous poets. And and, and it will be good, good to feel at ease with that. So this type of proposal uh, will lead us to think that, that we can suggest a type of identity with respect to those who are devoted to this craft. Uh, we are writers in indigenous uh, languages. But uh, as time goes by, uh, we have adopted uh, the possibility to, uh, to uh, be identified as olaritores. Um, this is an identity or a word that gathers our realities when we are within our community. Our, our, we have a, a neural relation and we share with our, uh, we convey these messages with them and then we receive the messages from our uh, older people uh, orally so this is an identity that we cannot disregard and uh, this is something that is present in our day-to-day -day activities but when when we suggest a written text 
in both our language in, and in Spanish, we assume a different identity within the framework of literature. And this is why this two actions, uh, I would say that we will have two types of identities, but these are activities or traits that are uh, specified in, in whatever we're trying to propose and which uh, will make us feel at ease in, in the oral literature or what we're adopting is to become oralitors that will make us uh, feel more at ease in this identity process. And within this dynamic, the exercise and the word will from, from our maternal, our mother tongue, will, 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 uh, will lead us to investigate our own language. And this is a very interesting and nice exercise because we're moving into finding that uh, spirit of the word. Because when, we, when you talk to uh, your grandparents, and, and, and this is where I suggest some of the elements that, in my opinion, this is something that we all do. Características de, de la oralitura. Y es que la orali, en la oralitura planteamos eh, una palabra antigua y una nueva palabra. Esa palabra antigua tiene que ver con lo que pues guardan nuestros abuelos, guardan nuestros eh, mayores de, en, en nuestras comunidades y ese es un tipo de lenguaje muy particular, incluso yo me atrevería que es un lenguaje mucho más ceremonial que el que nosotros usamos hoy, porque con el paso del tiempo, eh, digamos, ellos solamente hablaban la lengua materna, ¿no? El español lo aprendieron mucho, mucho más después que nosotros. Por ejemplo, el caso mío, yo, yo aprendí el español eh, cuando ingresé a la escuela y luego sí fue paralelamente so, ese proceso. When I came into school and then there we had an, a, an education process, but I first learned my mother tongue. But I refer to this because I feel a difference when the elders talked among themselves, they use a an Asian language, and this is a language that we have unlearned. And we talk, even though we speak the language, we speak with a language that it's a little bit more modern. And uh, here, we need to be really careful, and we need to uh, research our, our own language because we will find some things hidden in the words, we will find messages and codes that actually transport us to other kind of knowledge. Uh, and in the midst of this process, the simple fact of um, using some words in certain order, we, it's that doesn't end up in a poem. So we need to do some research and ask our elder uh, in because when we're writing about something and when we build texts, when we create poems that have to do with deities or sacred places or ceremonies that are part of our community and culture. And these are more demanding subjects because for instance, our elders know deeply and certain terms uh, about our peoples and what they represent. When we talk about games, for instance, if, sorry, fire. When we talk about fire, it's not a composing around fire. There are specific elements that are part of our mother tongue and that are uh, uh, embracing what our elder uh, transmit and there might be different concepts around it. So if we are able to gather, to compilate all these concepts, our proposal will be more fluid and we will have more elements in order to transmit this. And 
I think this gets a bit more complex in, in uh, our role. I value a lot what Natasha does and some others, uh, originary uh, brothers that are dedicated to the structure of our languages, no matter the genre it incorporates or it is part of. It's a noble effort of composing and producing this in our mother tongue, but this goes beyond a simple composition or a simple order of characters. It goes um, beyond doing this process and we have this research process in our own mother tongue. So it's important that you all know this because each poetic construction, I think has that force that has that strength. First, we need the conviction that this happens this way. And so there is another peculiarity, it's that we're individuals and when writing, uh, the inspiration and the effort for organizing uh, characters, words, and ideas, uh, uh, perhaps has relates to an individual fact, but the content and the meaning has a collective uh, load. Uh, and this that we propose will be analyzed by the people in, in our community and they will qualify and they will take ownership of this and they will value of this and they might be surprised and perhaps they might say that they could have done it better or they may also say well he's not saying or expressing the whole meaning there's something missing and that's the beauty of uh, sharing this with our community what we're trying to build so we are getting into very particular things and I just wanted to bring this to the table on the oral exercise of word conceived from the ancient word and the uh, modern one because that's what we're trying to build at this moment but together and united the ancient and new word should have this strength that allows us to exist and say that we are here with all that strength that comes from our elders uh, and this word will become into that possibility uh, for our current generations. I think it's really important to highlight this idea of uh, the exercise of reaching our memories and how poems become some sort of files at the same time and they are in, in constant movement because here i wonder up to what point you see in your communities hugo you mentioned that in your case and your generation you talk your language from a modern place if compared to the grandmothers and grand to our grandparents so uh, what's the opening in your communities in both cases on this evolution and changes in the language and up to what point as part of this modern language that you mentioned there are some other kinds of languages uh, for instance, if there is influence from Spanish or in the case of Natasha from French or English and up to what point it permeates uh, the, the language, it, it gets into the language. I don't know if Natasha, perhaps you would like to answer. You're muted. I would be interested to hear we'll go on that first. You, you what? I'm sorry. I didn't. Oh, sorry. I said I would be interested to hear Hugo on that first, on, oh. that, on that question first. It's for you, mm -hmm. Masha. Your turn. <laughs> uh, okay, sorry. <laughs> I thought you were talking to him and responding oh, to I was, what he I was, said. I was talking to both, but yeah, I think it, oh, okay, it yeah. Nice. Um, that you start with that question, that answer. Okay. Can you just re-re-say, re-tell the question? Sorry. 
<laughs> I wasn't reading you. <laughs> okay. Um, no, I was uh, I was talking a little bit about that all these new ways of the language in in Hugo's case um, in comments uh, mm -hmm. that he was saying that right now he actually he speaks in a kind of a modern way but mm. um but when he when he talk with older people it is another it is like a more antique language even if it's mm. kind of in both cases but right now he has like a modern way to talk and i was just wondering um in all this like do you have, did, did you hear all the translation of Hugo's words, what all, what he was saying? Yeah, it's because I was reflecting a lot about what he was saying about modern and, and old, old language. Yeah. So that's why when you ask your question, I thought it wasn't for me. So I was like trying to, <laughs> no, <because laughs> to think I about it because I, it was very, oh, uh, yeah. sorry. No, it's okay. I just, I just want to know um what do you think um talking from inu community about all this discussion about language and modern language and if and maybe if if if, if there is some new influence um from english or mm -hmm. from french in the inu language and how inu people feel about it Yeah, um, uh, yeah, I was thinking uh, before answering like to that question directly, I, I would, uh, I, I'm going to start from uh, the fact that uh, what I'm hearing here already is like, it's, of course, it's clear for us here that we're speaking a very modern, like very uh, modern Inu and very different from the old one. And the fact that when we speak to the elders, of course, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's already a, a more complex Inu than what the young the young ones are speaking right now. But I I know that from a few elders that are still alive right now, they they knew they used to know a, an old form of Inu, with which was called uh, the no no imun, which means like the the language from the inside of the lens. I don't know how to say that because it's a very, and they used to call it also language is, although we are a few nations in Quebec that we are, who are speaking different languages now, we all have linguistic links and we're still very close in some ways as well. We can even understand a bit of each other but it has been like millennia since we had, we used to be the same tribe and we got separated going on our own direction on the land. And since uh, we, we spoke, of course, different languages and mostly today, it's very, uh, very far from each other, but the Nojimu Amun used to be the language that hunters who used to go very deep into the lands and they were then en ending up to meet in the very middle of the Quebec territory. If you see it on the map, you can imagine where they were meeting. And they were speaking, and I heard that it was a very, very old Inu, even more old Inu, and related to the other languages as Cree, Atkamek, uh, Naskapi, and even like Anishinaabe. Uh, it used to be, the, they used to speak the same language. It, it, they say it comes from that very common language we used to speak. So I see then three kinds of levels, I would say, like uh, the Nojimo Imun, the old Inu, and then the modern Inu. And I would say the old Inu is more speaking, as I said, it's more language of action and action of being on the land. So all the vocabulary was related to the trees, to the rocks, to the rivers, to the, you know, the canoes and being in movement into the land and being nomadic. And now the, the modern Inu is so different because we're not, 
you know, we're not using that vocabulary anymore. And it's very special because that vocabulary used to be the whole Inuimun, you know, the whole language. And now it's like it changed so much since we're not actually moving, you know, and then we are we have been forced to be into villages and uh, stopped from going back to the land for many, many decades. And so the language, the Inuit changed so much. We still have so many like uh, ways uh, uh, of, of speaking, expressions or words that, that come from the land and being nomadic, but we don't use them the same way as before. And also like the modern language is mostly a huge translation of, of our lives in the villages of today and translations of sometimes French words from uh, two Inu words. So it's like sometimes we use uh, abstract things to, to, uh, from, from French that, that ended up in, in Inu, but that we use to, in the day-to-day -day life. So it's sometimes when I think about it, I'm glad we're still speaking Inu, but when I think about it, it's like we, we lost a lot of the old language we sh that we should have been maybe using right now if we would have been, been forced to stay in reserves, as they call it now. Uh, yeah, still. Um, but when I, I speak, when I write poetry, I can come back in Inu, I can come back to, to where I, come, I, I actually come from, like from the land. And from there, I can, if I write in Ninu, it's like going back to the land, I'm using back the, the, the perception of being myself in the land. So it's my vocabulary is already changing from there because it's like a way to go back to that old language. Even if I don't know it, it's like I can use the same definitions without knowing I'm using the, what, what we used to say in, in in the old Inu. Uh, so today is like, they, uh, I'm thinking about, for an example, by example, I'm just gonna keep going with that. Uh, Josephine Bacon, she's a, a, an, an elder. She's a very, like, she's a 73 or five now. She, she's an Inu poet as well. And she was my, men, my mentor for years and years. And she was one of the first, uh, almost the first to actually uh, published uh, simultaneously in French in Inuimu, and she was translating herself, her own poems to Inu. Uh, no, the, it's the country actually. The last, it, it's funny. The, the, her two first collection of poems, they were written in Inu first, and then she adapted it in French and to be able to publish bilingual books. But then the last one, because she was mostly in town, she had the reflex to write, write first in French and then she adapted it in, in women. So it was very like interesting as, as, as work, as, as her, for, for her own work. Uh, but she was all, uh, always speaking about how the languages are so different. And when, when as I can read Inu myself, when I read Inu, it's so different from the French. Like it's not almost, a, it's not the same words at all but the same ideas remain, so I can like see, but of course in, in her own poems, when she speaks of the land, of course, like colonial languages as French, uh, English, Spanish, the, I've, I see it like they won't never be able to actually translate what we mean when we speak about the land and indigenous life in our own languages. And it's, some people we see it as a barrier and I don't see it as a barrier. I think it's just like we have to accept these, these strong differences between the languages and we just have to find bridges. And I think that, of course, again, poetry and literature, because we are able to play with the words, we are able to, to, to at least uh, keep, as I said earlier, like the intentions and also the ideas and the images and just to change the way to to, to, to write them in French or English or Spanish afterwards. Um, but then uh, for me, I know where I'm, I am right now, like 
I'm mostly speaking colonial languages now. Uh, I barely speak Inno, uh, and I'm far from being able to speak it. But when, every time I go back to my village and when I'm surrounded by Inno people, I'm able to respeak it and to have almost complete conversations, but it's the basis, you know. But one day I would like to be a linguist and to be able to, to, to be a, you know, specialized in Inuit and to be able to speak it again, but it's a long way from, from here, but it's a dream. But I'm, I'm still very uh, sad about the fact that uh, I'm not able to speak it every day because like, like I have a strong example. Lately, uh, uh, we we uh, we were able to make a play in in mostly uh, no, a, a whole play in fact of an old text from an Inu woman from the seventies. It was translated in Inu. No, she she spoke in Inu. It was translated to French, and then it was published in in the in the two languages. And in the past months, with a friend, we worked on the play. And it's her, a whole text of 70, uh, 75 minutes, whole in Inuimu. And he asked me to read it. So it, it's, it's a play where I read the text and I play that, that, that person, that character. She, she used to be an activist, Inu activist from the 70s. And she was already very, uh, very old when she began to speak about injustice. But lately, uh, as I have been working on that text, which is more than one hour, and just speaking only Inu for one hour, you know, which is I never do in my daily life, you know. Uh, every time I try to read that text and I have to play, you know, I have to play, you know, not to play actually, but to transmit her own, like, her own message. But every time I go by in that text, and like I can feel, I can start feeling like sore in my in my head, in my you know, in my mouth, and even my my throat and all my my shoulders. They are like, oh my god, I'm like so tired after we you know hours and hours of speaking my language again. And it seems like some some it's something that we don't really think about sometimes when we think about the languages. It's like how. Our bodies, when we speak one language, one specific language, it has a way to configure itself to speak, to speak it, and to actually spell the sounds and spell the the words and the the, the syllabics. I would say, syllabic. And and when we go back to to another language, which is very different, you know, from the the language we speak uh, every day, like me for me going back to inu it's very painful <laughs> it's actually it's it's sad to say but it's painful to 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 get it back into my body to be able to speak it in the right way to spell it in the right way but then after that suddenly it's like my brain starts to change i think how i structure my my thoughts how i speak after you know when i go back to french it's like, but I almost feel there is a kind of decolonization happening in my own cells when I speak again my own language for more than an hour. And of course, from compared to day-to-day -day life, like more than five minutes, you know? <laughs> so I find it like, I think, I think we don't feel how much we are losing right now of from indigenous languages because right now of course there is my generation but the, i heard lately that the the young ones the children now they're just speaking french now and it 10 years ago it wasn't like that 15 years ago it wasn't like that even five years ago it was a bit different but now hearing that the children are speaking french it means that there is something happening here right now and you know people from 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 until now, we we were the, the the last ones to actually speak our own language for sixty percent of the population. So it's a very huge percentage compared to other peoples in in Canada, and even uh, uh, in, in Quebec. Uh, but there is another nation still speaking at ninety percent. But uh, for us to see 
the, our children speaking only French and barely understanding Inu, it's a very, a very big shock we got in the past, in the two, three past years. And now people are just working and working to trying to, to, to give new services and new, like, uh, to, to develop more uh, linguistic tools. But of course, like the main influences for us are the movies, the TV series, the TV, the, all the news happening in French. Everything is happening and made in French. And also myself, I find it more to be able to write in Inu, to be able to speak again in Inu. So then the young ones, if they are looking at me somewhere, they can see that I'm, I'm making that work because I know there is an emergency right now. And I have my responsibility as a poet and writer is to push in the culture to so we can help it to survive for the next decades. So, um, so that's sorry, it was a little bit about this thing. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you Natasha. Um, me da muchísimo pesar porque está muy interesante esta conversación eh, en realidad entre ustedes dos. Yo soy una muy feliz espectadora de todas las reflexiones que ustedes nos han eh, compartido en este espacio, pero lastimosamente ya... Uh, of all the thoughts you've shared here, but unfortunately we need to close. We ran out of time. I don't know if in order to close, uh, there's something else you may want to add, a uh, brief comment. We run out of time and before saying goodbye. Hugo, you're, si you're muted. Well, this is part of these new languages. And uh, how important it is that we state some ideas with regard to the experiences each one of us have uh, from our own, um, own work. And uh, if not institutionally, uh, with uh, we, uh, we can keep on this conversation. So I would like to invite Natasha to keep talking because these are subjects that are transcendental. Uh, for instance, what she mentioned about the percentage of speakers of our uh, peoples, it's something really delicate, really important. And it's a huge responsibility because uh, it, it, this is about the survival of a language, of a life, the life of a people through their language, or perhaps it's the loss of another language in the world. And on a daily basis, this is happening. And we transcend to a different space in which it's not only the aesthetics or the shape or uh, the meaning of a poem, but this has to do with responsibilities of life or death of our Aboriginal peoples, because if a people loses its language, they practically lose 99% of their identity. They may exist in the territory, but they won't be able to call what there is in their territory with the originality of the language of our elders. So we transcend and we start talking about something really more uh, and more political because this is not only about poetry or literary genres that we have adopted to make our contributions from our the traits that we have but this um, has to do with the strategies that we will be developing so that we strengthen our originary languages to strengthen them to uh, protect them um, for that we need to develop a whole proposal in which states have a lot to do uh, around these processes and logically this dynamic of colonization has been one of the goals so uh, in, so that we forget our languages but fortunately we're here um, from our trade, from the poetry, 
I think we can do great contributions so that we can overcome this difficult situation, which is that our languages are disappearing. And I wanted to thank all the institutions that had to do or were involved with this uh, uh, meeting of uh, words and cross readings and being able to read the reality of our peoples, in this case, the Inu and Kanshak peoples. I don't know the conditions of the current uh, Inu people, but in the Kanshak, we are up to now at 50% of speakers and new generations that are not speakers. So the Kanfla, in which it's at a real risk of disappearing because there is a high percentage of our kids and young uh, uh, and youth that do not speak our language. And this is something we need to consider with our mother tongues and uh, with from our possibilities, we need to contribute. Thank you very much for the invitation. And Natasha, it was a pleasure getting to know you. Hopefully I'll get to know your poetry. And we started this path and I reiterate that we need to do greater efforts in order to unite our peoples. Julia, thank you very much for uh, moderating this moment. And let's keep in conversations with different institutions that have made this possible. So thank you for the invitation. Thank you, Hugo, Natasha. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to have been here today. Uh, Hugo, I'm very pleased to have met you and had the, to have had that very wonderful conversation. And of course, I really wish to be in Colombia very soon <laughs> to be able to meet. Uh, uh, did I say Colombia? Is it in Venezuela? I don't know. Sorry. Oh, no, no. no. Yeah. Bienvenida. <laughs> Bienvenida. Yeah. Be welcome. Be welcome. We are in touch. and. We will be waiting for you here. Here we have a library and memory house where we are developing different, conducting different works, so training with our children and youth in creative writing, and this in all the drawing skills with our youth. So we're working on illustrations so because we have a challenge of generating content, but these content should come from our communities should originate there, not only writing books or writing our stories in books, it's that our youth are the illustrators. And in terms of our memory, we've trained a group of youngsters in communications, those who have never used a, a camera and now they are uh, processing all this and registering all this as a process of generating content in this house of memory. So we have a lot to do. We have a lot of tasks. And Natasha, be welcome. The, here you have a place uh, where we can share and work. So be welcome. Biblioret. 20 años. Dándole un giro a tu historia.